What is the? What do you want me to say? You have found Chameleon, Season Three, Wild Boys. A production of Campside Media. Oh. <laughs> A heads up: This show contains discussions of an eating disorder. If you or someone you know is struggling with eating disorders, please listen with care. After the CBC Bush Boy documentary aired, one of the producers, Timothy Sawa, got a mysterious email. We got an email, and、uh, he said, "Those are my brothers, and you know, they're missing." Around that same time, back in Vernon, Corporal Henry Prose's phone was ringing too. One of the parents phoned me. And said, "That's that's my son, or those are my sons, and I'm in Sacramento, California, and they've been missing." On the phone were the parents of the Bush boys, the parents that Prose and Tammy had been trying to convince the boys to connect them with, the parents that the boys insisted wanted nothing to do with the outside world. After several months of nothing, the camel started coming through the eye of the needle, and it was Prose who had set this camel in motion. After the initial buzz had died down in the fall, and the boys stonewalled him for so long, he kind of dropped the case. But when the CBC came to town, Henry, being the media relations officer, dusted off the case and combed back through it. And he remembered one thing the boys told him that he hadn't fully looked into. At some point, they said they had a grandparent in the Bay Area, which is the San Francisco area in California. Prose was skeptical about pretty much everything the boys told him, but this kind of made sense. One of the most plausible theories was that their parents, like so many others at the time, had fled to Canada to dodge the Vietnam draft. Prose had tried the police down there, and nothing really came of it. But he hadn't tried the media, so Prose looked up the number for the San Francisco Chronicle, and he was quickly connected with the exact right reporter. I remember the. The fellow I talked to, he said, "This is great. I love this stuff. You know, I'm gonna do a story on this right away. I love this stuff." <laughs> so the CBC disclosure story aired nationally in Canada on Tuesday, March 30th, and two days later, on April Fool's Day, 2004, the San Francisco Chronicle ran a piece about the Green Brothers that included this gem from Prose: "Quote: The initial spin was that they were out of the pine trees and onto the mossy bank." No doubt they lived in an isolated environment, but it's not like they were suckled by a she-wolf. End quote. This article was a substantial bit of coverage and was placed prominently. In fact, I I think they put it right on the front page of the newspaper. The article got enough engagement that the Sacramento CBS affiliate showed images of the brothers on the six o'clock news, and a friend of the boy's family just happened to see that story. One of the neighbors recognized the two brothers and went across the road and told mom and dad, "You know, your boys are on the front page of the paper." And now the boys' parents were on the other end of Prose's phone, and their brother was in Timothy's inbox. All of them telling the same story: those two boys have been missing from Roseville, California. Timothy wasn't sure what to believe at first. You, just, you don't know when someone emails you out of the blue, right? So Timothy takes down the new names the emailer gave him. And he starts combing through missing persons websites, where he finds a familiar face. And then we saw the missing persons notice on the website and the photograph, and compared them and realized we knew who these guys were now. And then it all unravels. And I happened to be there while it was unraveling. It just happened. It just unfolded. With that, an email and a phone call finally erupted something we're familiar with in our part of the world—an avalanche. We got the information, and it was just like, "Okay, where's Tom? Where's Tammy?、Uh, we gotta—we just gotta go. We gotta do this." I'm Sam Mullins, and from Campside Media, this is Chameleon, Wild Boys, Part Four: The Truth. You're listening to Chameleon from Campside Media. You're listening to Chameleon from Campside Media. 
Timothy and Jillian began to absorb the news that the entire episode from the week before may have just served to amplify the boys' falsehoods. They had been careful to caveat the story. Repeatedly, they said things like, The boys claim. The boys allege. If you believe the boys. But still, the whole thing is sort of a journalist nightmare. So Timothy and Jillian kick back into reporter mode. If the original story wasn't true, then was the story in their inbox and on the other end of Prose's phone, was that the truth? Fortunately, Timothy was still in Vernon at the time, so he grabbed his cameraman and said, we're doing this again. They scrapped the season finale they'd planned and began re-reporting the Bush Boys story. Last week, we received a mysterious email. We checked it out and the truth soon emerged. So we went back to BC with our cameras rolling to see things through to the bitter end. Timothy calls the man from the mysterious email, along with a couple claiming to be the boy's parents, all of whom insist, yeah, that's my brother, and yes, that's our son. So Timothy's next call is to Tammy. We just said we think we found their parents, um, and we want to go see Tom. Will you come with us? Timothy and his cameraman hop in their rental car and start racing up Silver Star Mountain to Tammy's house, cameras rolling. One of the wild things amidst many wild things about how this story unfolded is that most of it unfolded on camera. And we just jumped in a vehicle and like we picked up Tammy and and I was like, okay, I think we better film all this. Oh my God, I can't believe this. I was in the back of the car and they already knew all this and I didn't. I didn't know anything yet about the parents discovering nothing. Poor Tom and Will, Jesus Murphy, why didn't they let us know? Tammy's head is in her hands, sitting in the back of the SUV. And that's when they filmed me finding out. I found out while I was on camera. And they had Diana on the Yeah. Phone. Timothy hands Tammy his 2004 flip phone and says, this woman's name is Diana, and she claims to be Will and Tom's mother. Tammy pulls up the plastic phone antenna and puts the phone to her ear. Hi, it's Tammy. How are you doing? Have they t- contacted you since um, they've left? You can hear her on the phone kind of saying, I think it's her, maybe it's her. Yeah, they've made up this huge elaborate story. I hope this is it. (laughs) See, I still am skeptical because it's just, their story seems so believable. The woman on the other end starts describing her sons. Sorry, we're totally talking on each other here. So which one's Rowan? I'm confused. Which one's Rowan? Rowan is Will. The woman named Diana tells Tammy that the boys she's known as Tom and Will Green of Revelstoke, British Columbia, are in fact Rowan and Kyle Horn of Roseville, California. Diana keeps talking, giving Tammy more details. That's him! That's what he's telling me. He, I had a conversation with... <gasps> this is your children. They don't... They do. They do. They have the opposite... Oh, my God. As Tammy listens, she covers her eyes and crumples forward, her head between her knees. As the Vernon subdivisions rush past the window, the phone antenna and Tammy's ponytail start to tremble. She's totally describing it. It's her. Tammy's now 90% sure that what Diane is telling her is true, but she's still not 100%. So to convince Tammy further, Diana begins describing a scar on her younger boy's torso. I'm going to look for the scar. I'm going to look for the scar. Okay. Okay, bye. Oh my God, it's totally them. Oh my God, I'm sweating. Tammy, Timothy, and the cameraman change course and start driving to Vernon Jubilee Hospital so they can ask Will about this scar. And that scar became something that was a big focus for her because, you know, she's been led so far down another path that she uh, really needs something concrete to know for sure. You know, if the mom knows about the scar and the scar's there, then then that's it. Oh, what am I going to do if those doctors don't let me in? They'll let you in. They better fucking let me in or else I'm going to freak out. They pull into the hospital parking lot and Tammy bolts toward the emergency entrance. Okay, where is the front? Tammy runs past triage down a long hallway, but she's intercepted at a security door. No, you you have to let me in here. Where are you going? It's me. You can't. You can't not let me in. Okay. Where are they? You just need to calm down. Because in this state, okay, my, th- their mother is not Mary and Joseph. I've been talking to them the whole time. It is his mother. I know he's been talking. Tammy's forcefully turned away and told to leave. She emerges from the hospital crying and purseless. She makes her way over to Timothy and the cameraman, and she's still in hysterics. He won't even talk to me. He's talking to me. 
me like I'm some psychiatric patient. And he's got my purse there though. Oh. They won't even tell me if he's got a scar. They won't. They said that they don't know that, that I'm, they're so, he's like, he's like, Tammy, calm down. And he's talking to me like I'm some psychiatric patient. I'm like, please just tell me if he's got a scar. I've got a mom who I know is his mom. And they won't even Someone goes back into the hospital to collect Tammy's purse as Tammy collects herself in the parking lot. The truth feels so torturously close, just behind those doors. Barred from learning the truth there at the hospital, they decide to try and find it across town. They start driving toward the hostel, hoping to find Tom or Kyle or whatever his name actually is. They pull into the hostel as he comes out the front door. Hey, how you doing, Tom? This is part of the (laughs) follow-up? Yeah, Yeah. exactly, the follow-up. For months, Tammy's been prying, questioning, fighting with Tom for details about his home, his parents, his 23 years of life before Tammy came into it. Whenever she felt like she was getting close to the truth, he'd push her away, get short with her, sometimes even get angry. But here, she has a specific question to ask that doubles as an accusation. But before she asks it, she needs to ensure that he won't just run away. All the time I've come to you and I've said, listen, I think, is this your mom? Is this your dad? Is this, could this be you? Could this right. be you? And if I, if you, in your head, if I ever got any of them right, would you just take off? Well, you wouldn't because your parents... Why would I? Right, exactly. Tom knows something's up. He smiles uneasily at Tammy, but she averts her eyes and is suddenly fixated on her hands, as if the truth about Tom and Will is written on them. They pull into the parking lot next to the library, where Tammy first saw them. They all get out of the car and stand in a circle, Tom's back against the SUV, the pale sun hanging over them like a lamp in an interrogation room. Timothy takes over. He's the designated confronter. I remember having to kind of confront him with this and wanting to kind of keep it simple, be straightforward. I I didn't want to... You know, I feel like he was being attacked. Tammy covers her head as Timothy starts to talk, protecting herself as if a literal explosion's about to happen. A mother came to us, said she has a son named Kyle and another nun's son named Rowan, who were living in California and who left about a year ago. Are you Kyle? And I just will never forget the look on his face. You could literally see his brain kind of processing that this big lie he'd been living was about to come crashing down. And he's just kind of, he's looking, but he's not like, he's like staring into the distance. Like he's not seeing you anymore. He just kind of disappeared. Are you Kyle? I told you everything that I said about myself. I have nothing else to add to that. Is your name Kyle? Kyle looks away and Tammy squints up at him and tries a different tack. If he won't answer that question, maybe he'll answer a simpler one. You know how you said you'd always be honest with me about things if I asked you a certain question? This ha- Does Will have a scar on his abdomen from a spleen? Uh, with spleen removed? He has a scar there, yeah. There's almost a physical impact to this information. Tammy has to walk away from him. She curls in on herself and cries 12 feet away from Tom. Or pardon me, Kyle. As he shoots the camera, a Jim Halpert smile. After composing herself, Tammy comes back, arms crossed. That's what this lady said. If it's her son, he's got a scar from a bicycle accident. Tammy cocks her head. It seems like she's waiting, expecting him to start explaining everything. But he doesn't. You must have known this was going to happen. Darn, you're the best storyteller ever if this is not true about the bush. (laughs) Thank you for all those compliments. In the moment that he's confronted with the truth and his lies, Kyle doesn't look scared. He doesn't look ashamed. He looks tickled and says, thank you for all those compliments. He agrees to talk to the woman claiming to be his mother. Tammy dials Diana and passes the phone to Kyle. Hello? Hi. Who is this? So he um, gets on the phone with his mom and he starts out by saying, who's this? And you can see he's trying, there's a part of him that's trying to keep the lie going or hoping somehow he can keep the lie going. But as Diana talks to him, Kyle slowly concedes. 
Thank you though for worrying about me. Bye, I love you too. And then by the end of the phone conversation, you know, he says, I love you. And, and it's clear at that point to all of us um, that this is his mom and this is the truth. Everyone took a quiet moment in the parking lot to recalibrate. Tammy's body language is that of a person trying to psych themselves up to clean up a huge mess after the last party goer has gone home. It was like an, almost like an out of body experience. Like, is this really happening? It just was like devastating. I don't think of it. I've never felt like that in my life. The parking lot where all this went down is conveniently situated right next to the downtown police station. Tammy throws her arm around Kyle. My buddy. Let's go and talk to Corporal Posa. He's probably there. You're listening to Camellia from Campside Media. You're listening to Camellia from Campside Media. Corporal Henry Prose was the one person in Vernon who, from the moment the boys opened their mouth, had called BS. Tammy walks Kyle to the police station and to Henry's office, where, after months of questioning, Kyle was finally forced to tell the truth to Prose. Did you get to have a moment <laughs> with the boys where you were like, well, well, well? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, I... I probably said it to myself, you know, that, that you know, okay, the, tr the truth will, is, is finally out. And I probably felt pretty good about that. But no, I was professional enough not to rub it in their faces, I don't think. After all, he wasn't surprised. The story sounded off to the cops from the very beginning. As his boss, Randy Kolibaba, so articulately put it. Man, if it walks like a duck, dresses like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? <laughs> So Pro Se started the process of alerting immigration and figuring out, now what? Do they get deported, arrested? So while he was figuring that out, the boy's parents were on their way to Canada. CBC Disclosure arranged and paid for them to fly to Canada, with the implication being that by accepting, they were also agreeing to a sit-down interview upon arrival. And back in Vernon, Timothy waited for them to arrive. So there was this 24-hour period where we were waiting for the family to arrive and we had to, like, we felt like we didn't know if Tom or Kyle would leave. So he, um, I can't remember how or why, but he ended up staying with me in a hotel room. We had a, a big enough room that we could have separate kind of areas. And I didn't know him that well and I knew what he had just done and I had seen the look on his face when this all came crashing down. Um, and so I remember kind of keeping one eye open. Roger and Diana Horn arrived the next day at the Kelowna airport and were taken straight to the hotel where they were reunited with Kyle in the parking lot. Diana jogs toward him, beaming, arms outstretched. Hi, Kyle. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Good. So good to see you. Well, you look the same. <laughs> Jillian Finley of CBC was there to watch the reunion that day. Obviously, they're relieved as hell that, that he's fine and, you know, that they're alive and, you know, all these things that they probably didn't know for months and months. They're also really mad at him because, you know, especially, you know, Rowan's now in the hospital. He's so sick. Why did you stop calling us in December? Uh, just, I don't know. So just a phone call would have helped, you know. The confident and unflappable Tom Green is now merely Kyle Horn his body language regressing into that of a teenager being lectured by his parents. Yeah, but, but how is it that you allowed him to get down to 84 pounds? Because that's... I didn't, like, measure him all the time. He just got that way, I guess, when he started eating uh, fruits. He just kept losing weight a little bit. But didn't you notice that he was substantially thinner than when he was 111 um, and left home? I noticed that he was thin. He knew he was thin, uh, but, you know... I couldn't really force him to eat differently. After the parents were reunited with Tom, it was Jillian's turn. Just a few days after she'd first met him, Jillian found herself in the same position sitting across from the now Kyle Horn. 
this time telling the real story. How disclosure unraveled the mystery and where the Bush boys really grew up. If the previous week's show had piqued people's curiosity in Vernon, this one was mandatory viewing. The whole town glued to their TVs asking, wait, what? And more importantly, why? I guess there's really only one question to ask you, and that's why. Well, I had to protect myself and my brother. People uh, would be suspicious if we said nothing at all. That, that would not be accepted in society the same way. So that's why I, we came up with this story. But protect themselves from what? From their parents? Did the boys run away to escape an abusive home? Like if they were forced to return home, would they be in danger? What kind of home could produce two boys like this? Well, this is where we live. This is where Kyle and Rowan grew up. This is Kyle and Rowan's sister, Duan, giving a TV crew a tour of their family home in Roseville. CBC hired a local Sacramento crew down there to film the boys' home, to try and get some clues. But what they found was even more baffling. Um, this is our living room. This is our computer, our kitchen. This was Kyle's room. I found Rowan when they shared a room. Um, it looks a lot different than when they were here. I cannot overstate how normal this home looks and this family. It all looks extremely suburban. There's normal tan couches, bookshelves with lots of books, fridge magnets, house plants. It's the kind of place where you can practically smell the casserole or hear the dad jokes. Even their sister seems surprised that this home produced two boys capable of something like this. We had a really good upbringing. We had, you know, it was, it was very normal. Um, so I don't understand what exactly happened. Their sister could be cast as a prom queen. Their parents sitting on the couch, the most normal folks imaginable. Their dad's arm slung casually across the back of the couch. And why did the boys run away? The details were familiar. Rowan, the younger one, had a restrictive diet, which caused him to lose weight, which caused concern, which led to authorities threatening intervention. It was like deja vu. Their parents hadn't kicked them out. Their parents had been desperate to find Rowan help. As we all watched, we kept waiting for it all to make sense. And while we did get some facts and details about their past life, it didn't feel like we got anything that fully explained why they would do something so extreme. The only thing that did seem clear was that it did all make sense to Kyle. No matter how hard he was pressed, he continued to respond as if what they'd done was completely logical. And it seemed like he'd sort of cast himself as the hero who saved his little brother. Rowan was still in the hospital, so only Kyle was interviewed. When asked if he was surprised that people believed his story, he replied with what sounds like a master class on how to dupe people. Well, if you uh, kind of go into details and stuff, and make it a little strange, it's more believable to people. Put in strange things that make people like say that's weird, they're gonna believe it more likely. It didn't seem to register with him that, that maybe he should be apologetic for, for everything that happened. I think he said something like, you know, it's, it's not my job to tell the truth, which I think is a very strange thing to say, isn't it? Do you have any remorse for what you've put them through? No. Not for Tammy? No. I, I thought what I did was necessary. Does that make it right, what you did? I don't think it's wrong. He didn't even comprehend that there was a reason that he should feel badly about having done this. That's, that's the impression I had. I mean, I liked him a lot less after that, you know? You're listening to Chameleon from Campside Media. You're listening to Chameleon from Campside Media. As word spread about the Green Brothers, they once again became a media sensation. It was just a story. They made it all up. The story turned out to be false. None of it is true. 
In the coverage, I remember them being from California had a certain taste to it. The subtext being, obviously they're from Hollywood with their made-up stories. One headline in the province newspaper read, Bush boys turn out to be beach boys. Never mind that Sacramento isn't even on the ocean. Community owed apology, read the local headline in Vernon which featured a letter from a reader that said, Kyle and Rowan, I believe you have behaved as spoiled brats. You owe the good people of Vernon a big apology. An apology that was not gonna come. Not from Kyle, at least. Not even to the person most affected by all of this. After the parents arrived, Tammy arranged to meet them in town. And uh, I remember meeting them in a hotel, a motel, actually. And, uh, Yeah, the whole situation was very strange. In the small motel room, Tammy struggled to navigate an awkward situation. What do you even say? So nice to meet you. Your sons are liars. So how long are you guys in town? Your boys took advantage of me. The parents, at least, were deeply apologetic. They were, they felt really bad. I think they were completely blindsided as well because the dad was super remorseful. And so they were really, um thankful and really remorseful. Like, they did have a sense of guilt, for sure. And they kept kind of nudging Kyle. And I do remember his mom saying, you need to apologize and thank Tammy, something like that. And Kyle, with no apparent sincerity. He'd be like, thank you. Like, (laughs) you know, just kind of doing what he's told. But there was no remorse at all. No remorse at all. The only emotion he appeared to feel was pride. Yeah, I remember him smirking, and I think it was more like a sly, like, I got caught, oh well, like, just didn't, like, yeah, and I remember being angry at him. I remember that. Super angry, because I felt so duped by him. And I wasn't mad at at Rowan. It was more him. She'd confronted him before his parents arrived. I asked him, like, why would you do this to me? Like, why would you do this to everybody in the community and all this? And he basically, his, his whole thing was, you chose to believe me. You know, that he just put the blame on, you know, people gave to us out of their goodwill. They didn't have to do that. No apologies. Like, he was never, never sorry for anything that happened because it was my choice. When pressed, Kyle would say, I don't need to feel bad that you helped. It was your choice to help. And despite everything, despite all that they'd done for the boys, despite the lies and the lack of remorse, in the aftermath the people of Vernon, Tammy included, say that they're glad that they helped the boys, especially Rowan. I I think, though, the overarching feeling was um, one of sympathy and compassion. Sean Harvey, mayor of Vernon circa 2004, when all this went down. Because, uh, you know, as Canadians, I I think our value has always been to uh, try and lend a hand. And uh, turns out, The boys were very much in need, just not in the way we had originally been led to believe. They didn't need help navigating civilization for the first time or to be saved from parents who abandoned them. But with Rowan, if they hadn't helped him, he quite literally might have died. I, I, you know, no matter what happens out of the whole thing of it, at least the kid lived. Daryl Stinson, local member of parliament at the time. And to me, that's the bottom line. You know, I, I could care less about the rest of it. You know, it didn't matter. They needed help. I mean, that guy could die. Guy could have died, you know, without that. If, so, no, I'm just glad that the parents got their kids back uh, safe. You know, they didn't have to go to a funeral. Growing up in Vernon, it's a tough place to feel proud of being from sometimes. Like, when you say you're from Vernon, no one's face lights up with recognition or is like, Vernon, I love Vernon. This story started out as a real rallying point. It confirmed something that we felt about ourselves all along. Like, sure, we don't have the best ski hill in the Okanagan or the cool wineries or malls. And we don't have the most impressive, notable people section on our Wikipedia page. But we don't care about that. Because in our town, we look out for each other. We're a town filled with people like Tammy. Look at how good we are. But then the truth, which turned this story that we were proud of into something 
to be embarrassed about. We're naive. And we rallied around this thing that, in retrospect, was obviously fake from the beginning. You get the sense, even 17 years later, that all of this is still a little raw for Tammy. Yeah, it changed me as a person and it changed me in, in a lot of ways about trusting people and maybe having, you know, more, you know, just not believing everything as, as you know, if something doesn't make sense. And I've always said this to my kids, if something doesn't make sense and it seems too crazy to believe, it's you can find out there's always a truth behind there. The experience just burned a little too hot to not feel like it melted a small part of her. It wasn't my energy that mattered. It was the energy that took away from my family. It was the energy that they took away from people in the community that I sucked into, to, that I felt I sucked into coming into this and helping. You know, whether that was people donating food or, you know, the money that it cost the medical system, everything. So I felt I was really responsible for that. Uh, it just was so crushing, right? Publicly crushing. Just a week before she'd been on national TV lending credibility to the Bush Boy version of the story. And then it crumbled in the most dramatic way with cameras rolling. Uh, it was just so awkward. Just my most vulnerable moments, right, were captured and just feeling like a complete fool. Yeah. Yeah, it's so uncomfortable and embarrassing. And if it was a private emotion, it would have been much easier. But because the entire town and, you know, some of the world knew this story that I was part of instrumenting, right? Yeah, yeah. It just was, like, devastating. Tammy took a lot of convincing to participate in this podcast. At one point in our correspondence, I couldn't get a hold of her for a month. And then when I finally did, she laughed and admitted, I've been avoiding you. Actually, when I reached out to people to talk to for this project, I was struck by how no one wanted to talk about it. I'd need to call my prom date's mom to get her to text an old friend of hers to vouch for me. Or I'd have to Facebook message a guy that I was in a high school play with so that he could tell his dad that he should trust me. Nearly 20 years later, everyone involved still has a bit of a bad taste in their mouth about this. Or lingering trust issues. The brothers tested our town. They were like a fire drill for compassion. And for Tammy, it felt like it confirmed some of the worst feelings she had about herself. Ugh, oh, I'm gullible. I'm an idiot. I was part of the problem. I should have known better. Tammy's residual shame and guilt as she revisits the story are palpable, which is really sad to me because, obviously, Tammy is the best in all of us. And no one, not a single person I spoke with, felt about Tammy the way that she fears they do. I thought she was remarkable. You know, I thought, how many people in this world would have done for those two kids what she did? I thought she was kind of a hero in this, you know, she had, she was the Good Samaritan. She saw people who needed help and she stepped in and she stuck with them. She was a very kindly woman and she was out to help them and, and that's a good thing. She was really invested, genuinely. Like she genuinely cared for them as her, like her own children, I think. After months of generosity, the Vernon and Canadian authorities did one last extremely generous thing. No one charged Roan and Kyle Horn with anything. They were free to go, though the Horns were saddled with a large hospital bill after their boys racked up $68,000 worth of medical care, which is hard to do in Canada. The Horns were told to leave the country that their sons had entered illegally at their earliest convenience, though Roan could stay until he was stable enough to transport. And even in this moment where Tammy was hurt and embarrassed, she showed up to the hotel where the Horns were staying with her whole family in tow to say goodbye to Kyle one last time. In the busy hotel lobby, Kyle stands stoic and unemotional, wearing his familiar self-assured smirk. And Tammy stands before him, tears in her eyes. You get, I hope you get some help down there. And I know you don't think you need it. 
maybe be able to talk to somebody and figure all this out for yourself, what happened here. Okay, take care. No matter what happens, I still think you're a great guy. I still think you're a great guy. I hope you get help. What's remarkable watching this is that Tammy's not just saying the right things here. When you look in her eyes, you can tell, even in the end, that she means the right things too. And, and, and I remember it, watching them as they were driving, as they were leaving, thinking, you know, that is a family and a relation that ship that is going to take a long time to sort out you know there's so much that's happened now that they have to deal with and uh, um, that's not going to be easy for any of them a couple of weeks later the media left town all the pieces had aired all the stories had been written and tammy was back to her regular life as a full-time hockey mom all that was left was for there to be one final scene between cop and bush boy Rowan's weight had finally stabilized, and arrangements were made for him to be airlifted back to California. And it was Corporal Proce, of course, who volunteered to see him off. I drove to the hospital, bundled him up, put him in the back of my police car, and I drove him to Kelowna Airport, to where the the private planes land. Would it have just been the two of you? Just the two of us. The drive from Vernon Hospital to the Kelowna Airport is a beautiful one. As you leave town, you have a panoramic view of the whole city. You can see up toward Tammy's house, the snow at Silver Star, East Hill where the hostel is, and all of downtown. And as you wind south, you can see down the valley to Cal Beach and Cal Store. The emerald greens of Cal Lake would have been with them the whole way out the driver's side window. It was a quiet ride. He had nothing to say, and uh, you know he had spent weeks in our hospital. All these funds and time and effort had been expended on him from people in the community. Proce pulled into the airport, got Rowan out of the car, and escorted him onto the runway. But that last time I saw him, he, he just struck me as so ungrateful for everything that people of Vernon had done for these two boys. And he walked up the gangway into the plane, never even looked back, yeah. and it was gone. As Proce drove back north, He watched the plane take off and headed back to the detachment to mark the case, finally done. And that's the last any of us really heard about the boys or from them. Until 17 years later, it's mid-pandemic and I'm pushing my sleeping daughter in her stroller through Trinity Bellwoods Park in Toronto. And some synapse fires in my brain that hasn't in a very long time. And I remember this story. And I think about it all day. And that night, I go on the internet and pull up all the articles about it. And I just still have so many questions. What was going on in that family? How did they get across the border without passports? Was this a one-off? Or if they lived a life littered with bizarre stories and aliases and hoaxes. They just seem so troubled. Are they okay now? I wonder if I could find them. And if I did, would they talk to me? Did you like growing up in Vernon? Oh, oh yeah, totally. So you know why we stay there. Yeah, it's exactly. It's a perfect little town. It's right? a good spot for you guys to land. So I'm just running and I and I turn, make a turn and I hop another fence. I didn't even bother looking behind me because I was too afraid. Normal five-year-old, normal 10-year-old, not normal 15-year-old. I don't know what changed. And that's what I showed as evidence to the policeman that I feel he's a threat to society. They're sort of like Nazis. <laughs> come and take people away. If you understand Kyle's intentions and motives, you'll see there's no no wrongdoing, nothing he needs to account for. Hey Kyle, give us a call um, on Daddy's phone. Mine's not with me. We're really hoping you'll meet with Sam and, uh, you know, it's best if if your point of view comes out in the story. And the set of people just judging you and guessing your intentions. So please consider meeting with them. I'd like you to call us and let us know. Okay, bye. It's all coming up in the second half of Chameleon, Wild Boys. Chameleon is a production of Campside Media with Sony Music. Wild Boys was reported and written by me, Sam Mullins. 
It's produced by Abukara Don, and our editor is Karen Duffin. Our senior producer is Ashley Ann Krigbaum. Sound design and mixing by Hannes Brown and Garrett Tiedemann. Original music by Hannes Brown, Garrett Tiedemann, Epidemic Sound, and Blue Dot Sessions. Our fact checker is Alex Yablon, with additional production support on this episode by Lydia Smith. Special thanks to our operations team, Doug Slaywin, Aaliyah Papes, and Allison Haney. The executive producers at Campside Media are Matt Scher, Vanessa Gregoriadis, Josh Dean, and Adam Hoff. Just a heads up, we're taking next week off, but we're going to share an interview we did with our friends over at Art of the Con, a new talk show for Chameleon subscribers. In our interview, we talk about how the podcast came to be, and I explain some of my small town, one degree of separation that I have with some of the voices that you hear in the podcast. Chameleon subscribers can also listen to episodes of Wild Boys one week early and ad-free. Find out how to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, and we'll pick up where we left off in two weeks. So we'll see you then, and thanks for listening. If you or someone you know is struggling with your relationship with food, please know you're not alone. There are free, confidential helplines with people just waiting to help. In the U.S., you can call or text the National Eating Disorder Association at 1-800-931-2237. That's 1-800-931-2237. In Canada, the National Eating Disorder Information Center hotline is 1-866-633-4220. That's 1-866-633-4220. Thanks for listening.